This is an overview of Philip Devine's views about torture, and he argues that torture should be prohibited by the government. And just as an overview, he argues that torture should never be sanctioned by the government. As we see, we, he may consider possible cases where torture could be morally justified, but that doesn't mean that he wants the government to sanction torture in any situation. Torture not only is the infliction of pain intentionally, but Divine is concerned that it dehumanizes a person. It produces fear and shame. And because of that, it is especially problematic if our government were involved with it. So the use of torture is problematic in two ways, just on a more practical basis. What Divine argues is that it would result in a downward spiral of retaliation. So if our nation was to torture an individual from another country or organization or group, then that would result in that organization torturing our people if we were captured and so on and so on and things would escalate. The information gathered, Divine argues, is not reliable. Now, there are arguments on both sides of this, but Divine claims that, look, one being tortured is going to say whatever the tormentors, tormentors would want in order to escape the pain. They're, they are in a situation where the pain is overwhelming and they're going to do whatever they possibly can to have it stop. So they would say anything and it may not be reliable. I would like to make a caveat uh, to note on a comment, since he begins his article with this uh, statement about a bill that was vetoed by George W. Bush, I think it's relevant to just be clear on the accuracy of this, because Devine is a little bit inaccurate in his description of the bill, especially given his own views on the topic of torture. Now, in that situation, the vetoed bill would have made it illegal to use waterboarding specifically and then some other comparable interrogation techniques. So it was narrowly directed at those things, and Bush did, in fact, veto it. Devine states his description is simply that it would have outlawed torture, and he finds it nearly unbelievable, odd, very disappointing that anyone would veto it. How could you veto a bill that would outlaw torture? Now, the problem is on the very next page, Devine goes on to argue that he doesn't consider waterboarding a form of torture. And so since the bill was narrowly focused on waterboarding and other comparable techniques, it really, according to Devine's own definition, was not about torture. Uh, it seems his own view is consistent with Bush's veto of that bill. Just wanted to make sure that we're accurate when we point out historical events. Now, Devine considers how we, broadly speaking, make judgments regarding torture. And he says different courts and other experts have made the distinction between the limited use of coercive techniques, which would be permissible, generally speaking, and the use of torture, which would be broadly condemned. And there seems to be a continuum between these two things. There's a continuum between what is torture and what is acceptable. So there are clear cases, certainly, of something being torture, clear cases of something being acceptable, but exactly where that line that distinguishes the two is unclear, and, and the difference is often determined by an observer's reaction of repugnance or other gut responses as divine calls them and divine joins others in questioning our ability to make moral determinations simply by our, our gut reactions to things so he he calls into question whether this is a good way to think about the topic of torture Instead, he argues that we need some philosophical reasoning here. We need to be uh, careful and reflective about the topic and not, not rely on these gut reactions to make policies. 
So he goes on to consider arguments about torture, and he has two arguments in particular that he looks at in defense of torture. One is provided by Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham is a utilitarian and was very influential for John Stuart Mill. And so Bentham, when you think of uh, Bentham, think utilitarianism, think John Stuart Mill, think consequences. And what Bentham does is he describes a captive who, have, who has information that could prevent the torture of thousands. So there's an individual who's included, involved in a group who's been torturing uh, thousands of people and that person has been captured. And the way Bentham describes it, we have this situation where we either continue to allow the thousands of people to be tortured and not torture the individual, or we torture the individual to get the information needed to prevent the torturing of thousands. And Bentham says the, the argument is, obvious, the conclusion is obvious that torture uh, would be justified in such a case. And presumably, we're talking about government sanctioned torture, the governing authorities using the torture. So that's one argument. But Devine also considers a more contemporary argument by Michael Levin, a very similar kind of argument where Levin has a thought experiment where we have a group of terrorists planning to use an atomic bomb in Manhattan. And the only way to stop the terrorist group is to torture one of the captives. So they, they catch one of the individuals involved in the terrorist organization. Um, and they say that, look, in order to get the information to prevent the nuclear weapon from going off and killing likely hundreds of thousands of people. We need to torture the individual to get the information to stop it. And in that case, torture seems to be justified, Levin argues. Levin adds that there would be a, this limitation uh, on the use of torture that would protect us from misuse because we only use it to torture the guilty in this case, a terrorist, and we do it to save the innocent, the hundreds of thousands of people in Manhattan. So Devine uh, responds to Levin's thought experiment by arguing that the ultimate conclusion there is based on a fallacious use of a slippery slope argument, and this is problematic. What the analysis is that Levin has provided this extreme case and, and then argues since we should use torture in that extreme case, the government should sanction its use and go on and clarify how and when it ought to be used. But Devine argues that when you start building policies on extreme cases like this, then they can have horrifying consequences when they are implemented on a large scale. So we have this one situation where, yes, it could be morally justified to use torture in that very narrowly defined thought experiment that Levin provides. However, going from there to sanctioning torture could be very problematic. For one, we have many humans involved who make mistakes, make errors in judgments, and so on, and Devine goes on to ask rhetorically, should we have trained torture doctors then? Should we train people in the techniques of torture? Is this what we really want to get involved with? And of course, his response to these rhetorical questions is no. Devine also raises concerns about bias if we were to implement a policy allowing torture that uh, for example, a Muslim would be much more likely to be tortured than a non-Muslim in the exact same situation. So it would be problematic for that reason as well. Devine goes on to ponder what conventionalism might say about torture. And he says that, well, in our society, we built into our constitution prohibitions against cruel cruel 
an unusual punishment, and that would seem to prohibit torture. So on the one hand, we have by convention, we have reason to prohibit torture. But then again, on the other hand, according to conventionalism, society is the author of the moral law. We call, if conventionalism is correct, there are no objective moral principles. It's all up to the society or the culture, and the needs of the society would be greater than that of the individual, and that might provide a defense for using torture. And that's pretty easy to see. If a, if a society sanctioned its use and, and said that we should do it, then that would be the end of the story, morally speaking, and it would seem also to give good reason to provide a legal basis for allowing torture. And uh, because of that, Divine says that we need to look for uh, arguments regarding torture uh, someplace else besides conventionalism. So he considers five different arguments for why we should prohibit torture. The first argument is based in liberal political philosophy. And, and just a note here to be clear, liberal political philosophy is not inherently liberal in the contemporary political sense. What, we, what he's talking about is the theory that provides the foundational principles for a democratic society like ours. This, it, it was liberal political philosophy that provided the rationale for our constitution, our founding documents. And liberal political philosophy provides a balance then between authority and anarchism. So it, it's allowing individual rights, but it provides an authoritarian structure where uh, people can thrive. And on this basis, just thinking uh, as in terms of a nation, on a national view, Devine argues that it's in our national best interest not to torture, if for no other reason than the reputation of the country. In other words, if it were known that the United States were using torture, then the reputation would suffer and that would be problematic in a variety of ways, in, in trade, in negotiations, in, in getting other people on board when you want to have a co military coalition, in all kinds of, of ways it would be problematic. Two other arguments why we should prohibit the use of torture. One is a Kantian argument that provides good reason not to uh, torture. For one, it goes against the first form of the categorical imperative. You would not want it to be a universal law to allow torture. There might be a situation where you would be somebody being tortured for one reason or another. And probably, though it's not stated here, the second form of the categorical imperative provides even more reason not to torture. If you're torturing someone, you are clearly using that individual as a means only and not as an end. And that is a obvious violation of Kantian morality. And so it seems on that basis, we should prohibit torture. Despite what the early arguments for the use of torture uh, being were, and they were based in utilitarianism, what Devine says is that the utilitarianism actually gives us a reason not to use torture. And a couple of primary reasons for this. One, the information obtained through torture is unreliable. So we've, we've mentioned that before and why that might be the case. The second is that not using torture can have positive consequences. So Devine points to the Persian Gulf War when Iraqi troops surrendered to the United States by the tens of thousands, and, and Devine argues Part of the reason they were surrendering, willing to surrender, is they were confident they would receive good treatment. They were confident they weren't going to be tortured. And the United States reputation going into that war of not using torture had positive benefits then on the battlefield. So as a matter of fact, not using torture has these, has these positive consequences. And so uh, utilitarianism provides these reasons for not using torture. A fourth argument on why we should prohibit torture is a argument based in virtue ethics like that of Aristotle. And the idea here is that prohibiting torture 
ought to be done because the one doing torturing is becoming less virtuous by being involved in the process. And since our goal is to produce virtuous, happy people in that uh, Aristotelian sense, uh, this is going against that. And then finally, Divine looks at natural law as a reason to prohibit torture. Now, natural law is a label that is typically used to refer to the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas and Christians in the Catholic tradition. And natural law condemns torture for four different reasons, according to Divine. So the condemnation of torture by a recent pope is a consistent with the natural law, and there are official Catholic teachings that say that torture should not be used. And then, as we reflect philosophically, we have four other reasons. Uh, for one, torture produces extreme physical pain that inhibits the higher faculties, and natural law um, is something that promotes and wants to encourage the use of higher faculties, so torture against, goes against that. Often in the use of torture, sexual assault is involved, and so that reduces a person to his or her bodily parts, and uh, that is problematic. Torture sometimes includes assaults on a person's belief system, which ought to be condemned by natural law. Um, we don't want people's belief systems to be um, we don't want individuals to have to go against their belief system, we should say, uh, because they're being tortured. And this is an assault on that. And similarly, Divine makes a fourth point here that the aim of torture is often to get a person to betray their deeply held moral and political commitments. And we should have a culture that is protective of individual moral and political co commitments and since uh, natural law provides us uh, this description of this problem of torture, uh, we have these reasons based in natural law not to use torture. So wrapping things up, Divine argues that our intuitive reactions to torture do provide some strong motivations for prohibiting it, judges, experts, appeal to these, and they, they do provide some motivation for prohibiting it, but the problem is that they can lack careful reasons. And, but while no theoretical argument can do complete justice to the horror evoked by torture, uh, several and various theories provide very good reasons to prohibit it, and so we've considered five of those in particular here.